Good afternoon and welcome to the Middle East Forums webinar and podcast series, Israel Insider with Ashley Perry. I'm Stacey Roman and I will be moderating this discussion today. We are pleased to have Mr. Ashley Perry, advisor to the Middle East Forums Israel office, join us here each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern to update us on all the events going on in Israel. Mr. Perry will be giving us a briefing on current Israeli affairs for 15 minutes, then open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type out your question. And now, with no further ado, I will turn the discussion over to Mr. Ashley Perry. Thank you very much, Stacey, and good evening. Uh, it's been quite a, a fascinating uh, and interesting last 24 hours, uh, actually last 23 hours since the exit polls were first released. Um, those of you who have seen the results will know up until this point, first of all, we still don't have the final results. We still have around 10% of the votes to tally. And the reason for that is uh, because we have what's called in Israel, first of all, when you vote here, you put, you get a series of uh, little notes and you put whichever party that you want into an envelope. Uh, and, and then you put that into a box and that's your, your voting. Uh, basically, um, what happens is, is there's a number of votes from soldiers and diplomats, people who don't vote in their home address, and they are tallied later because what happens is the Electoral Commission has to make sure that they uh, only voted once because they could vote at their non-home address and in theory also then run home and vote there. Usually it's not that high a number and usually doesn't change the map significantly, but obviously in the age of COVID, uh, lots more people are not voting in their traditional polling stations, whether they be because they have COVID itself or because they're in isolation or because they're in a hospital ward, an old age home or whatever it is. So the number's actually risen to about 10%, whereas usually it's around a few percent. Uh, so they're going through each vote painstakingly, uh, ensuring that each person is only, uh, only voted in one place. And we're expecting to find the uh, final results Friday morning, they want to get this done before the Passover holiday, which starts Saturday night. Obviously, Sabbath is also a bit problematic, so they want to get it done by Friday. But at the moment, we have about 90% of the votes in. And what we have is, at the moment, uh, a sort of dead heat, a situation where uh, basically neither side, not the pro-Netanyahu bloc, including Yamina, who hasn't actually officially come out and said that they will support Netanyahu, but it's assumed that it's uh, possible to include him in that block and the anti-Netanyahu bloc. Uh, at this point in time, neither uh, the Netanyahu bloc with Yamina uh, is only making 59 and the alternate bloc uh, is even less than that. I think it's, um, I think it must be 56, something like that. Uh, the wild card at this point is not even Yamina. Yamina was supposed to be the kingmaker and still invariably may well be. Uh, but at this point in time, you mean it is not enough to give uh, either side um, the keys to the prime minister's office. At the moment, the real wild card is Ram, which is the Islamic Islamist party uh, run by Mansour Abbas. We've talked quite a lot about him. He's the person that some would argue was turned, quote unquote, by uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. He uh, broke off from the joint Arab list. Uh, to run independently um, and basically against a lot of people's expectations past the electoral threshold and then some is actually up to five seats at the moment as we know four is the minimum and uh, when the exit polls were released and for quite a few hours uh, Ram were considered very far from passing the electoral threshold in fact one of the pollsters said I do not believe there's any chance of Ram passing the threshold but what now uh, we understand is that in a lot of heartlands of Ram, in the Bedouin uh, towns in the south, uh, the pollsters are not particularly strong, so they did take them into account. So now we see Ram passing and passing extremely strongly. Ram is a real wild card because it has basically said that it will go with either side. It's not in the pocket of either camp. Uh, traditionally, the Arab parties have not gone with the right wing have not become part of any government, has in the past uh, supported the government from the outside uh, during the uh, Rabin uh, government uh, starting in 1992. Uh, so it is possible that that could happen. That is something that Mansour Abbas has talked about, not being part of the government, but supporting from the outside, which could lead in theory to a minority government. 
I personally see about three situations uh, coming from this. The first is that Prime Minister Netanyahu, with his natural allies, will make 59. I think he'll be working extremely hard to try and get those extra two from some of the parties across the aisle. I, he doesn't want to rely on Ram. There's a lot of people within his uh, block, especially on the far right, as we know the religious Zionists uh, did well and got in with about six, potentially even seven seats. Um, they will not sit well with Ram, even from the outside, uh, comfortably. So I think uh, Netanyahu, as we've seen many, many times before, will really do everything possible to try and bring some defectors across uh, from the left or the center. Uh, the most obvious is Gidon Saar's party, although Gidon Saar and Zev Elkin, uh, another former uh, Likud minister, have said that they will not leave. But I think the price will be high. But as we've seen, Prime Minister Netanyahu would probably uh, pay it. Uh, another possibility is even Benny Gantz. Uh, you know, he said he won't, but he said he wouldn't last time. Uh, again, there may be just other uh, uh, identified, maybe Yeshatir or others. Again, all he needs is two to get over to that magic number of 61. Uh, another possibility is that we just simply, no one forms a government and we go to a fifth elections as crazy as that sounds. Now, that's not a great solution for Prime Minister Netanyahu, even though he elongates his uh, stay in power. But as we remember, uh, going back into the current government or the previous coalition agreement, uh, Netanyahu has to vacate, according to that coalition agreement, the prime minister's residence uh, in about, I think it's October or November. Now, another series of elections with the coalition building, with the time that that takes, could potentially get something very, very close to that point. Now, would Prime Minister Netanyahu want to risk that everyone would stall and stall and stall up until a point where Benny Gantz basically just takes the keys to Balfour, uh, the Balfour residence, which is the Prime Minister's residence? Um, that's something which he wouldn't want to countenance, but something that could be held over his head uh, very prominently. So it's something that Netanyahu wouldn't want, but it's certainly a possibility if no one comes, sort of climbs down from their tree. The third option, which is being talked about, but I think is a little bit of a long shot, is that the anti-Netanyahu camp, and this would have to include uh, Ram, uh, the, the party we just talked about, is that they don't necessarily have to make a coalition. What they could do, uh, while there is a new Knesset with all the new Knesset members, um, it, if they create a majority, they can vote out uh, the current Knesset speaker, which is Yeriv Levin, a very much confident of uh, Netanyahu and vote in one of their own. We saw that attempted last time uh, with the crazy scenes of Yuli Edelstein refusing to give up his post when he was Speaker of the House, even though the Supreme Court ruled that he had to. Uh, that could play out again and then pick someone for the Speaker of the Knesset, uh, someone from the anti Netanyahu bloc, perhaps someone from Yeshatid or, or one of the other parties. Now, what that would do is give them a lot of power and a lot of control over the agenda of the Knesset, and then even vote in uh, a majority of members to important Knesset committees like the Arrangements Committee. The Arrangements Committee is basically the Knesset Committee which designs the agenda in that sort of holdover period until the formal committees are then um, populated by all the different Knesset members. Now that's vital because as I said, if they took over those two, then the anti-Netanyahu bloc would control the agenda. And they could then possibly, but again, they would need every single member of the so-called anti-Netanyahu bloc and Ram to vote for a law which would prescribe uh, someone uh, who is uh, uh, you know, in criminal proceedings under an indictment, whatever the language would be, from forming the government, from uh, becoming the next prime minister. That would obviously, uh, have massive ramifications because it would ensure that Prime Minister Netanyahu would not be able to form the next government. That is some way off. That's being concocted by various figures. Uh, 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 Victor Liebman of Yisrael Betenu is leading that. Mirov Michaeli of the Labour Party said that she's very interested in also being part of that. But that would again need, you know, all these sort of disparate parties uh, to work together. It would be much easier than for them to form a government because I think that would be not just unlikely, almost impossible to have the joint list, Yisrael Beitenu, uh, Tikva Khadashah of Gidon Saar, all sitting in the same government. And with all these parties, most of these parties apart from Yeshatid are in single digits. So it'd be almost 
impossible to even find some sort of coalition agreement, let alone divvy up uh, ministerial positions. So I think that 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 you know to create a coalition out of these parties is impossible. But there is this other solution, not to necessarily form a government, but to form a working relationship to take control of the agenda of the Knesset in this sort of middle period and ensure that Prime Minister Netanyahu can not form the next government. Uh, I think those are the options on the table. Everything can change. If Netanyahu gets 60, then uh, what I just talked about in the Knesset could not happen because the opposition bloc would not be able to get a majority. At the moment, he doesn't have it. Uh, but not only are there 10% of the vote still to be counted, there's then the uh, agreements the, um, uh, between parties where they give the excess voting. Uh, we talked about that a number of weeks ago where, where two parties who have an agreement uh, basically uh, sign a vote sharing agreement and the party with a larger number of seats then gets over the, over the number of seats that they have, would then get from the uh, party with the less amount of uh, excess votes and potentially get another seat. Um, there's talk of, for example, Saar and Bennett who have that agreement. And if it goes to Saar, that's another seat for the anti-Bibi bloc. But if it goes to Bennett, that could be number 60, perhaps even number 61, if they get another seat from the, uh, uh, the, the 10% that, uh, of the votes that are still uh, ready to be calculated. So unfortunately, we won't know any more today. We won't know any more tomorrow. Friday, we'll know a little bit more. But as I've said many times before, uh, governments are not formed on election night in Israel. There's, no, there's never a clear winner. Uh, elections are won through coalition negotiations. And what we've seen with Netanyahu successfully over many, many years is he may not win an outright election, not him, certainly, and not even sometimes his natural allies. But what he does do is he does negotiate very well. He ensures that uh, he can bring people across the aisle. We look at Ewald Barak in the past, Sipi Livni, uh, Benny Gantz. These were all people who said that they wouldn't sit, Amir Peretz, who said they wouldn't sit with Netanyahu, or certainly ran uh, in opposition to him, but then eventually came into his government. So, and, 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 and uh, basically the bottom line is Netanyahu needs very much uh, to get to his 61. Uh, his political future relies on it. So I think that, to my mind, is the most likely uh, scenario but it remains to be seen. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you so much. The first, first question we have in is, uh, what is Ram's political position and how does Ram and the joint list parties differ? Well, first of all, Ram in the last elections and ever since they increased the electoral threshold, I think it was in 2015, uh, have run together because it was felt that each party on its own, there used to be four parties or five parties, each party on its own would not get over the electoral threshold. So they ran together and they got anything, uh, nice double digit numbers in the last election uh, reached a high of 15 seats. Uh, at the moment, uh, the joint list without run are expected to get six seats, which is a massive uh, failure to a certain extent. And they say that the the uh, percentage of voter turnout uh, went down in general, and especially in the Arab uh, uh, sector, and even many in the Arab sector may have voted for quote unquote Zionist parties, mainstream parties, and Likud may well have uh, received one or two mandates from the Arab sector, which they uh, sought uh, during this campaign. Ram is an Islamic party. The other parties, uh, the, the Arab street is largely uh, divided into three. Uh, again, this is a bit of an oversimplification, but for the purposes of this, uh, there's the Communist Party, there's the uh, Arab Nationalist Party, and then there's the Islamic uh, Party. Ram is the Islamic Party, which is, you know, based obviously on religion, very, holds very conservative views. Um, one of the reasons for the falling out, at least ostensibly, is because of other parties in the joint list support for LGBTQ uh, issues in the last Knesset, whereas Hadash, which is the Communist Party, votes on the side of uh, allowing uh, greater rights for the gay community. It is something 
with outside of the remit of uh, Ram, and they will vote very much as ultra. They will vote like the ultra conservative Jewish parties uh, very similarly. And in fact, they do coordinate on certain issues. Interestingly enough, although they are an Islamic party, some refer to them as an Islamist party, uh, they are not a politically extreme party. They recognize uh, Israel, or they're not, let's just say, uh, you know, as extreme as some like Balad, which is an Arab nationalist party. Um, but it was never thought up until a year ago that they could conceivably sit in a, an Israeli government or support from the outside or hold a very good relationship, especially not with the Likud led government. So we're, we're, these are impre uh, unprecedented times. Uh, but Rama playing their cards very close to their chest, or at least Mansour Abbas, the leader, is the head of negotiations. Someone else in the party has said, come out a little bit less cagey and said that they would prefer a left wing government or a left of center or an anti Bibi bloc, uh, because that's more natural for them. And because they wouldn't sit very uh, comfortably with people like Itamar Ben Gvir of the Religious Zionist Party. So there seems to be a little bit of a disagreement, or maybe that it's, it's a planned strategy uh, to show that they're not in either side and to see what Mansour Abbas says openly, whoever gives them the best deal. Thank you. And what influence do the amount of votes cast have on the coalition government in Israel? For instance, does uh, more seats allow for more opportunities to be appointed to uh, the different? I mean, yes, obviously, the larger party you are, the more seats you'll get, in theory, at least, uh, the more policies that you'll get in coalition agreements. That doesn't always happen. Uh, we've seen many, many times uh, in the past, the first party Likud makes an agreement with, and it's relatively a traditional uh, position is with the United Torah Judaism, the Ashkenazi Ultra Orthodox Party, which is at the moment six seats and or seven seats and traditionally smaller than the Shas Party and some of the other parties. But it's considered uh, extremely important because when United Torah Judaism go in, um, Shas will surely follow. And then he shored up his most natural allies with the Ultra Orthodox community. Um, those parties, at least in United Torah Judaism, doesn't seek as many ministries, but seeks a lot more, let's say, budgets uh, and issues of importance. Other parties more interested in seats. Um, but again, we saw in the last Knesset, the Labour Party brought two seats to the uh, government and received two ministries, which is obviously, you know, if you look at the wider uh, implications of that, you certainly don't have 61 ministers. Uh, so it doesn't always tally up. It, it's, it's, it's down to what Netanyahu's needs are, what the demands of the party. Yamina, which, as I said, could be the kingmaker, possibly. Uh, they can ask for the world, and Netanyahu will have to give it. He's ruled out uh, another rotation agreement, another uh, you know, situation where he has to hand over the prime ministership uh, to someone else like he had in the last agreement. Um, but if Netanyahu... If, 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 um, Bennett is that 60 or that 61. He can basically ask for whatever he wants. And as I said earlier, probably Netanyahu will give it to him because he's such an important part because all the other parties have pretty much said that they'll sit with Netanyahu and they don't really have anywhere else to go. Uh, Naftali Bennett, in theory at least, could sit in the anti-BB uh, bloc. So it's all about uh, leverage at this point. Understood. And just for clarification, uh, for example, could Bennett ally with Likud coalition without having to always vote with Netanyahu? Are the MKs free to vote on issues as they see fit? No, I mean, I, I would say largely no. Like, like in any uh, government around the world, there has to be a certain amount of coalition discipline. You know, it's, you can't sign up to something and then basically vote as you want. The, the idea is then you are bound by an agreement uh, to vote on certain issues. And there's usually in these coalition agreements, it says, on, uh, let's say, on religious issues that uh, we agree to vote on, uh, we, we agree to abide by the status quo. Any uh, laws that come up will have to be agreed by so-and-so or will have to be done by this or that. But on the whole, there, there, there should be coalition discipline because if there's not, then there's no real reason for coalition because then everyone could just vote all over the place. But usually uh, the parties sit down and they work out common uh, points in the agenda and they ensure, at least the coalition chairman is supposed to, ensure that nothing 
is put on the agenda, which could cause any crises, at least at the beginning of a government. But uh, these days, uh, we, we don't have uh, too much of that. And there's crises after the first day. Uh, but in theory, uh, a government should vote together on the majority of issues. There are certain issues which sometimes you're, you're allowed to, you know, free vote, perhaps on LGBTQ issues in the past. Uh, Amir Ohana, for example, is an openly gay uh, minister in the Likud government. Uh, he's been allowed to vote against the coalition, let's say, on those issues. Um, that's something which the prime minister or the coalition chairman allowed him to do. Uh, and there are other issues like that. Usually they're not considered the most pressing issues, like, for example, on religion and state, which is extremely important to the ultra-Orthodox parties, it would be seen as strange for members of uh, the government to vote against. What they may do sometimes if they feel that it's against their conscience is excuse themselves, but that can come uh, with penalties, uh, certainly you know, from the coalition whip. Again, this is not necessarily unique to Israel. Understood, thank you. Um, so with voter turnout being fairly low this time around, has there been any serious movement in Israel for advocating term limits for prime ministers or considering electoral reform? Well, first of all, it wasn't low, it was just lower. Um, it was a few percent lower, uh, not too significant. But the second part of your question, my personal view is it's absolute necessity because we're moving towards, if we're not already there, in political paralysis. Um, we, we look at the blocks, we look at the last few elections, and, and just we could just go on and on and on. Uh, there's a lack of governability uh, in the system and that needs to be changed. Uh, Gidon Saar's party, Tikva Khadasha, which in the end really, uh, really didn't do as well as was expected, very much has that on their platform. They want term limits. Uh, some other parties have also talked about that, Yisrael Betaino being one of them. Uh, government reform, electoral reform, is the third rail in Israeli politics, is the thing which is most needed, but the thing least likely to be uh, talked about or acted on, quite simply because there are too many parties invested in the current system. If you uh, reform the system, raise the threshold, had constituency-based elections, there are too many parties which are now in power or part of the decision-making process, which would then lose that power. So they're not going to vote away that. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu did bring it up, I believe, after the 2000. 15 elections, he did bring it up, made a whole speech for about an hour about the need of electoral reform, and then never mentioned it again. My assumption is, uh, more than an assumption, um, that basically he got told by some of his natural allies, the smaller parties, it's not going to work for us, so drop it. So it's uh, a really uh, problematic issue in Israeli politics, but one desperately needed, to my mind at least. So how likely is it that the Knesset might raise the threshold again? Uh, very unlikely. If anything, it may lower because, as we saw, there were a lot of parties scrambling on the day of the elections to pass the threshold. In the end, all those that were threatening, you know, were sort of on the border, did pass. Um, but uh, it's, it's possible, but I don't think there's a great move for it. It's essentially not to move it to any great amounts up or down. Um, it's possible. Um, but at the moment, I don't think that's necessarily on the agenda, but it remains to be seen. And at what point does a coalition government become unnecessary? A coalition become unnecessary? Well, you have to have a coalition government because we that, that's the system that we have. No party receives 61 on their own. So you always have to have at least a, a number of parties, you know, we go back to the days where there was only three or four parties in the government, but that's usually when one party reached, you know, numbers in the 40s. Uh, so then they only needed two or three other parties to reach that magic number of 61, but invariably a little bit more. Uh, we haven't had that for a long while. You know, Likudo is supposed to have done very well in the last few elections by reaching the 30s, but they've always needed multiple parties. Uh, that's part of the problem. Um, but at the end of the day, in the current system, there is no alternative uh, to to rule, one has to have a majority of the Knesset, and that's 61. So unless a government will have 61, it simply cannot rule because it can't pass any laws. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, is the New Hope part of the 59 Netanyahu bloc, or are they considered opposition currently? At the moment, they're considered opposition. Gidon Saar was very staunch. 
after the results came in that he will not be joining a Likud led government, but uh, or at least a Netanyahu led government. But uh, as I said before, we've heard these things before. And there are a lot of people around the Knesset which don't necessarily believe that he'll hold out, especially if he's offered a lot, but that remains to be seen. And even if Gidon Saar himself will not join, maybe others in his list will. <coughs> Thank you. And what individuals in the anti-BB parties uh, might be tempted to move over to Likud? As I said, um, once he has uh, Bennett, and by the way, Bennett has not said that he'll necessarily join. Uh, many um, assume that he will because he wouldn't want to be seen as responsible for not uh, forming a right-wing religious government because that's where his base is. Um, but even if you go at the moment, according to the numbers, that leaves you 59. So he needs at least two more. Uh, as I said, Gidon Saar's party is the most likely because almost everybody who's joining the Knesset is a former Likudnik. Um, you have someone like um, uh, Joas Hendel, who's not formally a, a, a Likudnik, but he sat very comfortably, well, not amazingly comfortably, but uh, he was in the last government uh, under Netanyahu. Uh, there's no love lost uh, to any of these people, but if they're offered enough, maybe they'll go. Uh, Yisrael Betaino, I don't see, you know, they've been offered many, many times, and so far they, no one has uh, broken off. Um, the Labour Party, I don't see. Uh, it's not Amir Pez, it's Merov Michaeli. Uh, and I don't think that anyone from her block will, will join. Merits certainly will not even be invited. The uh, joint list will not be invited. Um, Blue and white, Benny Gantz's party. It's a possibility, as we've seen. He's promised before not to sit with Netanyahu. He ended up doing it. Perhaps there's other people lower down on his list uh, who may, because Blue and white probably will will not be a successful sitting in the opposition uh, for a few years. So perhaps uh, people lower down on the list will see an opportunity. And then there's Yeshatid, which is the largest party. Uh, Yeshatid is probably not the first place he's going to look, but I'm sure that Netanyahu being the strategist that he is, will he have even identified people on that list who he thinks maybe he can turn. Thank you. Has there been a single decisive issue for Israeli voters during this election, aside from for or against Netanyahu? Not really. Uh, that's the bottom line. This has been very much, uh, you know, that the elections of brand politics. Uh, if you look across the, um, really the whole campaign uh, um, and the election results, no party, I would say no single party has really managed to build anything beyond its base. There's been no party which has really gone beyond what is relative, I wouldn't say expected because the Labour Party in blue and white did better than was expected, or at least the polls were indicating. But again, they, they just sort of rebuilt their base. There's no game changing party which really did very well in keeping its base and expanding. Largely, I would say, uh, because there was no compelling message. There was no single identifiable compelling message to drive people uh, from other walks of life from other populations uh, to vote for a party outside of their base. Um, and I think because of that, we're, we're again in this sort of political paralysis. Um, and I think that's a problem. And I think as long as there isn't someone who comes in with that strong and compelling narrative that's really able to move populations towards them, we're going to be stuck in this situation. Uh, unfortunately, it was mostly about, are you for or against Netanyahu? Uh, there were some other issues on the periphery. Uh, Yisrael Betenu tried to make about the ultra-Orthodox. The ultra-Orthodox tried to make it about Yisrael Betenu, and they played off against each other a little bit. But at the end of the day, um, the strategists, you, you saw the posters, or anyone who saw the posters and anyone who saw the messaging, was very much uh, brand politics, personality politics, with very, very few issues involved. Thank you. And our last question of the day, has the COVID pandemic hurt Netanyahu or any of his competitors? Well, the interesting thing is the narrative is that the, um, the vaccine program, which has been very successful and continues to be successful, uh, is a large reason why Netanyahu uh, got the number he did. But if you look at the polling all throughout the campaign and even a little bit before, uh, because now we've become a nation which likes to poll every two days regardless of elections, Netanyahu was always polling between 32 and 28. And in the end, he's getting 
30 or 31. And that's regardless of a success or a four, uh, the vaccine program. So I wouldn't say that that really contributed. It's clear, as I said, going back to my point I made before, that Netanyahu has a solid base of 30, a little bit more, a little bit less, voters will vote for him regardless of the situation, economic, social, health, whatever. And if you look around the other parties, I would say that, again, most of them pretty much went back to their base. I would say the two parties with who really didn't uh, find a base are probably the two parties which certainly struggled the most uh, from a early high, and that's Yamina and uh, and uh, uh, Tikva Khadasha. Both of those parties at one point were polling in the 20s and in the end got relatively low digits. Um, Tikva Khadasha, Gidon Saar's party, which was considered an alternative at one point to Netanyahu, is now poll is now expected to get six. Perhaps it will get seven, but still that's massive uh, come down. Uh, Yamina, uh, again, was polling at one point in the 20s and was considered an alternate. Uh, alternative to uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu in the end is going to get seven, perhaps it will squeeze an eight, but even that is, is still, because quite simply they didn't really have a base, uh, or they didn't nurture a base. Uh, they try, they're, they're, they're two right-wing parties filled with right-wing uh, members of Knesset or potential members of Knesset who try to reach out to the centre and centre-left. And at the end of the day, when it really mattered, a lot of these people just went home to the left and the left of centre parties. That's why you saw merits pass the threshold easily. Labour do well, blue and white. Uh, and yes, it did pretty much did as it's been polling throughout the election. So we didn't see great movements. Uh, we didn't see, you know, uh, numbers, uh, you know, there were, there were some surprises, but again, no party which managed to break beyond its base. And I think uh, that's really, to me, uh, the message of these elections that we need someone with a very strong, new and compelling voice who's going to be able to reach out beyond the base and really change the dynamics and change the numbers because without that we're going to continue on this tie or you know this political paralysis so so that's hoping that voice comes at some point soon well, let's hope so and i'm sure you'll have more for us next week as far as this goes uh so we've come to the close of our webinar and podcast ashley thank you again for taking time to update us thank this you. week for our viewers and listeners, please join us Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern for a webinar with Steve Emerson discussing Does the Third Lebanon-Israel War Lie Ahead? Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a great day.